Thank you. So now we will shift gears to the final paper. Um, so can uh, Matthias and Andre come up, please? Where do I where do I flip where do I flip slides? Oh, oh here we go. Okay. <laughs> the magic. Okay, so um, um, good afternoon and thank you for this uh, very kind invitation here to beautiful Moscow. So um, um, I would like to uh, present from a, a fairly large research project and book project, in fact, um, which tried to ask uh, how far back in time can we actually track the differences between Western Europe and Eastern Europe. Now, um, this is a picture from very much 30 years ago when the, uh, when the wall uh, fell in Berlin. And of course, at that time, um, 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 there, there was the idea that sort of everything would get better and that history even had come to an end. Mm -hmm. So there was a, 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 a famous uh, political scientist, uh, American of Japanese origin, uh, Fukuyama, and he wrote, uh, in, in a famous book and essay, what we may be witnessing is not just the end of the Cold War or the passing of a particular period of post-war history, but the end of history as such. That is the end point of man, mankind's ideological evolution and universalization of Western liberal democracy as a final form of human government. Now, I've already heard some smiles here, and I guess 30 years on, we are actually all smiling a little bit at this, but this is what a lot of people thought at the time. And the economic equivalent of that political optimism was the idea that the transition economies, as they soon uh, came to be called, uh, would converge rapidly with Western Europe and the United States. Now, history hasn't ended, as we all know. Uh, and in fact, we also know that liberal democracy is clearly not the only game in town. In fact, what we have seen over the past three decades is that authoritarian regimes um, um, uh, sort of uh, led by China, if you will, uh, have had a very, very strong growth performance and have brought liberal democracies under considerable pressure, not least as far as how they look upon themselves. And um, in the European context, probably the question we, we want to ask a little bit is, well, has this iron curtain, which we hope would go away, has it been replaced by a persistent wealth gap? If you look at Germany and Ukraine, the countries are not more far away than an hour's flight, but actually the income differences per head is factor 20, which we cleverly downsized to factor six by using PPP typically instead of the unadjusted GDP data. Now, and that's where the story comes in. I think when we started thinking about that um, was that there was probably a very problematic assumption of the 1989 optimists, and that is that Eastern Europe had only fallen behind as a result of communism. But what we, are, what we were trying to push in this project is trying to establish how far back in time can we actually go to see where do these differences between Western and Eastern Europe come from. And this is something which in economic history is often referred to as the, the little divergence debate. So I think Branko Milanovic earlier today made reference to the great divergence debate, which is the, the, the big differences in the long run between Europe and Asia. And here we have sort of the European, the inter-European equivalent. And uh, we have tried to, um, to, um, to systematize and to bring together evidence from, from various disciplines, really, um, and trying to understand where do these differences come from, how far can we trace them back. Now, one of the most robust and furthest back in time evidences actually comes from historical demography which has long argued for a, a very fundamental, different, fundamentally different demographic regime between Western and Europe, between Western and Eastern Europe, uh, represented by the Hutchnall line named after the British researcher who detected that in the 1960s. That is evidence mainly drawn from 1900, but in fact going back early to as early as the 16th century. So um, um, uh, we or I, we, we, we then launched this sort of research project and invited uh, 25 leading 
uh, economic historians actually participate in that and to write very specific book chapters. Um, one is sitting here, Andre is commenting uh, mm -hmm. uh, on this today, and then we have Ilya, the organizer of the conference. Uh, they have both uh, written um, uh, book chapters alongside very many others as well. And um, I think one of the big problems we, we faced in this problem is that actually no one had ever dared to uh, bring all these different countries into one book. In fact, when you look at it, there really are three very different historiographical research traditions. One is on Eastern Europe, sort of Russia, Soviet Union successor states. One is on Central Europe, largely the Visegrad countries. And yet the third one is on Southeast Europe, on the Balkan countries. So we, we wrote all these 18 chapters and uh, sat together and discussed what we should think about that. And uh, while they are all quite different, they, they really tackle from very different ends four main questions. So the first one was sort of what are the, the deepest reasons for um, economic um, lagging behind of Eastern Europe? And then another question was very much um, what were actually the income levels by the time of the, of the communist takeover? Um, then an economic assessment of the state socialist period. And last but not least, the successes and failures of the transition period since the early 1990s. Now, I don't have the time to go through all four of them. So I kind of, um, I want to pick two which I hope are of interest uh, here in the brevity of time. The first one is a little bit on the long run growth figures and just to see that this pattern, this gap has been very, very stubborn um, over the past two centuries. And the second one is um, the third question which I referred to before, which is an economic assessment of the communist period. Now, when we come to the first one, uh, we are now in a position that we have annual data for all East European countries back to World War I. In fact, the research project has partly extended that back in time, for instance, uh, here for Russia, where we now have GDP reconstructions back to 1860. And uh, I'm comparing it here with, uh, with Britain and Germany as the sort of two main economic and industrial powerhouses of Western Europe. Um, you very nicely see here the, the, the huge impact of the Russian Civil War. You also see um, very nicely, or not so nicely, the Russian uh, transformational recession of the early 1990s. But probably most importantly, what you see is that actually these curves, which are in log form, the distance remains very much the same over these 160 years. Now let's take Hungary here as a, as a Central European country, I'm choosing Hungary because we can stretch the data back to 1840. It's again the same thing. Uh, the curves um, in the long run do not really change very much their distance. And we see the same thing for Bulgaria and Romania as two Balkan countries we can track uh, very much back in time. Now, um, what I'm doing here is basically taking this data, but distilling it for three key years for the three different regions, Central Europe, Eastern Europe, and Southeast Europe. And we take as a first observation, simply the first observation we have um, for that, for Hungary, for example, 1840. And then as a second observation, we take the GDP per head um, um, the year preceding World War II. And as a third observation, we take the year uh, before the global financial crisis. And really two things stand out here in this data, and that is you only have numbers somewhere between 30 and 40%. So Eastern European countries in the long run, they haven't really changed their relative income position and they've consistently hoovered at around a third of German and British levels. Um, and secondly, it's quite interesting to see that actually the relative position of Central East and Southeast Europe has also remained the same. Central Europe sort of leads, Eastern Europe is in the middle and the Balkan countries come last. Now, um, let me say a tiny bit here about, about um, uh, this, this one item which was really important in this research project and this is how should we economically view the state socialist period. 
Um, as you probably know, there is a sort of a venerable research tradition which has argued that politically communism wasn't perhaps the greatest hit, but economically it did deliver. And I think most authors contributing to this book have tried to challenge this perspective from various angles. So let me make sort of this revisionist perspective here um, on, on, on the state socialist period 1950 to, um, to 1990. Um, uh, this, in fact, is taken from the book chapter uh, uh, written by Andra Markovic with, uh, with Tamás Vonjo. And um, um, sort of as descriptive evidence, um, we compare here um, simple annual growth figures for the four decades of state socialism. And you see that the Eastern European countries, when you, when you compare them to the Western core countries, they actually don't do that badly in terms of growth, right? And they really only break down in the 1980s. But that is probably not the correct point of reference. What you should compare the Eastern European countries to is the Western European peripheral countries. So countries uh, like Finland or Ireland or Italy or Portugal. And when you do that, you actually see that the growth performance consistently lag behind these Western European peripheral countries. When you then look into a convergence framework, then you see that uh, the Eastern European countries uh, did experience convergence after World War II, but actually they formed their own convergence club and they form a convergence club with typically lower growth rates. So you have here on the, on the, on, so the right line is a sort of the, 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 the regression line for the growth performance of the capitalist economies, and the left one is for the, uh, for the communist economies. Uh, what is also quite noteworthy is that not only the level is different, but we also have a much higher dispersion around that line which is another way of saying that frictions, growth frictions, were much higher in the communist countries simply because the systems didn't work economically as well as the capitalist economies further west. Now, um, what then were the state socialist economies really good at? I guess there are really, they are really uh, four things you might think of that they were good at. Perhaps they pushed structural change more strongly. Perhaps they enabled fixed capital formation more strongly. They might have driven health and human capital formation more strongly, or they might have been better at promoting equality. I guess the first and the second one would be a result of the coercive nature of communism, and the third and the fourth one could be explained by a stronger political commitment uh, of communism to health, human capital formation, and equality. And before I run out of time, actually the evidence suggests that communism did not deliver on any of the four. So let me see how far I get here. In pushing structural change, yes, again, the reference point here is the, is the West European peripheral economies. We see that structural change proceeds quite well in Eastern Europe. More and more people are moved out of agriculture. But that problem actually slowed down considerably after the 1970s. So these European economies kept way too many people in agriculture, even though they had the coercive means available of doing it. Fixed capital formation. Um, again, there is a big literature which tries to show that uh, communist growth remains investment driven until the late 1980s. Um, but that on the most recent recalculation of the problematic investment data, is actually not the case. And what we see is that in the 1980s, all countries, except for the Soviet Union, which was, which was a special case, except for the Soviet Union, the investment breaks down. So the, 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 the communist growth model ceased to work, and the main reason for that was that investment was no longer politically feasible because consumption had to be increased at the expense of investment. Consumption had to be increased in order to maintain political support for the flagging political systems. Um, life expectancy, again, when you look at this as one of the most important indicators, 
The Soviet Union, Southern Europe, they start out very much at the same level in the 1950s, but Southern Europe increases that by a decade over the next four decades, whereas the Soviet Union increases that only <laughs> by four years. And um, um, actually, to the surprise of the researcher team at the time, actually, we also found that the, that, that the Gini coefficients in most West European countries changed more favorably over time than they did for the East European countries. So I think um, I have, I'm, left, I'm, I'm left here with zero, uh, with zero minutes. Um, I hope I've given you a bit of an overview. And perhaps I pass on to my, my, uh, my commentator, Andre. <laughs> On the desk. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to this conference. It's a pleasure to be at HEC. Uh, I'm a bit in a different, difficult position because uh, Matthias' talk is partially based on my own research, so I suppose to comment, uh, Matthias, Matthias commenting myself. Uh, I will do my best uh, to, uh, to deal with this challenge. Uh, so let me start and let, with the following uh, statement and let me underline the, the, the following fact. The, the essay, the paper which Matthias has just presented to you and which is uh, available at the website uh, is a masterpiece essay which summarizes and reflects on, on the key, or reflects on a huge uh, project which has just appeared as a book uh, published by Rutledge. And Matthias uh, brought together a wonderful team of 25 contributors from different uh, countries uh, to, to write down, basic, for the first time, I think, to write down uh, an economic history of Eastern Europe as a, uh, as a, as a one region uh, over, two, over two last uh, centuries. Uh, Matthias uh, mentioned that basically the region consisted of, of, of three major sub-regions, which are quite, quite different, uh, but I will still refer to this region as Eastern Europe uh, for, 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 uh, from, from once we are located in Moscow. We, we, this is the term which we still use in this part of, uh, we still use here for this part of the world. Uh, probably also my com comments will be a bit biased to proper Eastern Europe in Matthias' terms, basically to the, for to the territory of former Soviet Union, which, uh, with which I'm most familiar of and with which uh, I contributed to, uh, to, to, this, to, uh, to this book. Uh, Matthias presented only part of the findings which was we, 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 which this book made, uh, he mentioned four questions. In the paper, there are actually three questions. <laughs> and in the talk, he addressed two questions. I will try to cover all three very briefly to give you a flavor of what is in the paper and in the book. And by the way, Matthias will present the book itself on Thursday morning. So you, I think you are in, if you are interested, you are very welcome. So there are three major questions which uh, Matthias asks in these questions and how he structures the most recent research on the economic history of Eastern Europe in, over the last two centuries. And they are, what were the long-term factors impending economic growth in the region? How backward was Eastern Europe by the time of, of the communist takeover? And how should we assess the state socialist period? Uh, uh, these are the three questions which are in the paper. I would actually say, I, I would frame that, them all, I would frame them a bit differently because they all, all three of them deal with one, basically, one big question, which is how important are fundamental reasons versus policy, issue, policy reasons in term, uh, for the development of this part of the world during the last two centuries. 
uh, is uh, be, because the major the major finding the major finding of uh, recent research is that Eastern Europe is lagged behind the West over the last two centuries, and this, this the, and the, the gap was pretty stable, and f few things have been changed. So in this respect, there is a question: Are this gap appeared because of fundamental reasons, and to how much to 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 to, to what extent policy uh, uh, policy attempts to overcome this back, this gap are important uh, for it. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the Eastern European case is particularly interesting here because of state socialism ex experiment, which was probably the largest policy experiment uh, in, in, uh, in human history. Uh, I will I, I initially plan to cover all all three questions, but I, I have just <laughs> got a notice that I uh, that five minutes is left. So I will cover the other two, which Matthias didn't mention. Uh, Matthias didn't talk at all about fundamentals and about the debates in economic history why uh, Eastern Europe lagged behind the West in the 19th century and the most. Uh, General story is the story by Alexander Geschengron, the founding father of modern economic history, who basically said that this was because of institutions and mainly served them. In the in the in the in the, in the, in the, the paper, uh, Matthias discusses uh, the most recent research, the most uh, discusses modern literature on the subject, which shows the complexity of the phenomenon served them and, and difficulties to test the issue. But I would underline the research which appeared even, I mean, the book, to, uh, writing this book took, took, took time, I think five years or something. Uh, and uh, I, I would under, underline here the most recent uh, research which happened during the last three years. And in these papers, uh, there, I, I would there is quite, there is some support for the initial for the initial story uh, by Alexander Gershenkron, we and quite a number of papers shows that served them uh, had negative consequences for economic development of Eastern Europe, and this some some and these uh, uh, negative consequences are still present present today. So uh, I, I mean. Uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, this, in in this respect, one of fundamental reasons institutional institutions uh, are important, were important in the 19th century, and they are probably still important. Uh, their legacy is still important for modern uh, for modern for modern development. Uh, I will skip this and go to the story. Uh, to, to the second, to the, to, to the second question, which Matthias discusses in his paper, how how well uh, Eastern Europe developed bef in the before common period, how successful was structural transformation, and was development possible for following alternative blueprints? Uh, this is another question which uh, Matthias didn't cover much, I would say, in his, in his talk, but this is in the paper, and that's why I'm talking about, he, about this right now, to, to give you the flavor of the whole paper. Uh, Matthias uh, frames this debate, discussing the de uh, frame this question, discussing the debate between Allen and Mark Harrison and myself, but I should say that on top of this debate, there are new papers which, uh, which show that uh, that uh, development uh, on the line, uh, alternative line, was relatively successful before the comment came. <laughs> 
Um, so, Matthias talked a lot about uh, state socialism and cited and showed you several graphs from uh, several figures from uh, the chapter which Tamas Wonya and myself contributed to this, uh, to this volume and he underlined that we challenge the, in, this, in, this, uh, uh, in this chapter the general story that uh, so state socialism was good in uh, accumulating capital and was good in structural change, but in my comment I would underline that this is true for Eastern, U for Eastern Europe except Soviet Union. And Soviet Union was an important uh, uh, was an important case, which is not which uh, uh, which doesn't fit the story for our other countries. Uh, coming back to the uh, my initial my uh, coming back to my to, to my start, to the start of my <coughs> talk, I would like to ask. Uh, Matthias, how, in the end, how did the, ex state ex uh, the experiment of state socialism actually uh, change anything and how should we assess this, uh, this period in term, uh, discuss, uh, given the new <coughs> research you just reviewed? Mm -hmm. Thank you. <coughs>